The verdict is in on the Apple River stabbing case. The jury comes back and finds him guilty. We got some thoughts and some legal analysis on the trial. Stay tuned. This is attorney Andy Markintel and attorney Mark J. Victor. We're the partners at the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm here to talk about a pretty high profile case. How you doing today, Mark? Yeah, man, I'm not happy about this one. I'll just get that out there right now. But this is a good one for people to see because I think there's a lot to learn from what happened there's in this case. There's definitely some lessons to be learned yeah. uh, about, mainly the don'ts of what to do after a self-defense incident, uh, but we'll get into that. Why don't we start by just watching the video? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Oh, so that's the defendant yep. and he is currently surrounded on the river he was tubing and he's surrounded by 13 assailants a lot of them high school football players much younger younger stronger, stronger drunk and aggressive yep. Important to notice that it's about wading depth in the water, meaning it'd be very difficult to simply run away. Surrounded. Even the adults buying into this craziness. Unfortunately. And he's clearly not aggressive here. There ain't, there's no question about that. Like a pack of wild wolves have surrounded him. And now it's about to start getting physical. Yes. Pushed into the water. Yeah, punched he, in he the face. Hits his head on the rocks as he falls down. Pushed under again. Yeah, whole Dunk. bunch of people. They're holding him down in some areas of this video. And it's hard to see here, but there's a uh, cupping of his throat. So he came up with a folding knife. And I would say defended himself. Chaos ensues. And that's all the relevant parts. So there's a whole bunch going on in this video, but I guess we cover some of the major ones that are relevant to an analysis of self-defense. So first of all, completely outnumbered here. No question about that. And, you know, what you don't see in this video is this guy who's the defendant in the case. We should really call him the victim. But anyways, the defendant in the case, Mr. Uh, Mew, I think is how it's pronounced, has uh, apparently just fairly recently before this incident went through a quadruple bypass. Now, clearly, none of these people know about that, but that doesn't matter, right? The question is, is Mr. Mew at a risk of death or serious physical injury? Well, you see them pushing the guy down on the rocks, right? The river, anybody's been on a river like this, really slippery. You can fall very easily just by standing up. The testimony is that his shoes aren't, they're kind of falling apart. He falls down. He hits his head on the rocks. He's being punched, kicked. And then you don't really see it in this video, but there are some stills that come out during the trial where at least one person is sort of holding him down in the water where he can't get up. And okay, Grant, it's not super deep in parts, but it's deep enough to drown. I mean, how is this not an imminent risk of maybe not death, but maybe given his heart condition, but absolutely serious physical injury. Probably here. death, frankly, but definitely serious physical injury. You got a whole bunch of people around you, much younger, much stronger, drunk, agitated, yelling and screaming, punching the guy in the face, knocking him down. 
a couple of times. This is a really bad... See, this guy is entitled to defend himself. Does anybody really believe that if he hadn't done something to stop that attack, something urgent to stop that attack, that they would have stopped that anytime soon? Right. They were whipped up into a fervor. They were totally surrounding him, like you said, like a pack of wild wolves, just one after the other, all taking their shots. And when you have just had a serious medical condition... Um, and it makes you particularly vulnerable, that factors into the reasonableness analysis whether or not the assailants knew about it. Yeah, and if you believe that Mr. Mew is at an imminent risk of at least a serious physical injury, it's hard to imagine how you wouldn't believe that. He's got a right to threaten or use deadly physical force. It's important to note we're in Wisconsin. There is no legal duty to retreat. But a jury gets to consider what a reasonable person would do in such a circumstance. But is it really reasonable that this guy, I mean, he did start walking away at one point, but he's essentially surrounded by a whole bunch of people. The whole issue comes up because apparently somebody in his group lost a cell phone and he's kind of looking around in the river to try to find the cell phone. This guy is not acting, Mr. Mew, is not, in my opinion, acting with any kind of bad intentions, despite the prosecutor trying to get this out of him and make it seem like it was that kind of case in the cross-examination of Mr. Mew, who took the stand at the trial. There's a whole bunch of discussion about, you know, what happened when he first went up to the tube. But to me, all that's irrelevant because you see him after that incident, he turns and he walks away. That incident's over. Now it's the second part of the incident where they're punching him in the face, clearly knocking him down. I mean, it, it seems unbelievable that anybody in that position would not be in fear of serious physical injury or maybe even death. You said something that made me think of something that really made me angry about this verdict, which is that you're right. Wisconsin is a no duty to retreat state. But the way that the prosecutor argued the case, particularly with the very, very late in the game jury instructions asking for recklessness charges, which he argued was a lesser included charge, kind of created this weird, perverse duty to retreat uh, in front of the jury by arguing, hey, it was reckless of him not to run away. This is, in my view, outrageous, right? This is, I, I think, going to be a good appellate issue because mm -hmm. if I was handling Mr. Mew's appeal, I would be very interested in this recklessness conviction, right? I mean, clearly, this isn't reckless conduct here, right? Mr. I mean, keep in mind, recklessness is when you consciously disregard a substantial risk that something bad is going to happen. You don't want it to happen. You know, maybe even you hope it doesn't happen, but you take the chance and then it does happen. That's recklessness. This isn't recklessness. No, every single person that he stabbed, he clearly intended to stab. Yeah, so it's hard to see how a jury that's trying to do their job gets to recklessness here. Now, it's easy to see how a jury that's not educated in the law, that wants to go home, that's maybe fractured into one group that says, hey, this is self-defense, and another group that says, yeah, but he killed somebody. We can't just let him go. Might compromise and go for recklessness. But is this supported by the law? I don't see any reckless conduct here. Yeah, this is a really good appellate issue in my view because obviously he's charged with intentional homicide. He's charged with a first-degree murder. Then at the very end, during the part where the parties are asking the judge to give certain jury instructions, the prosecutor arguably brings this up for the first time to instruct the jury on recklessness. Well, if I was the defense attorney and I knew that I was about to be ambushed with recklessness, at the end, I would have argued the case and presented the case completely differently, keeping in mind a recklessness standard. That's total sandbagging right at the end, and that could be a good appellate issue. Remember, appellate issues are not for arguing that the jury got it wrong. We don't do that. We don't say, okay, the jury got it wrong, so you can take a second bite at the apple on appeal. That is not the point. The point of an appeal is to say something legally went wrong. The judge made an incorrect ruling that affected his constitutional rights, and there's a very good argument that it could be an issue on appeal 
appeal that it was an, a legal error for this judge to allow the recklessness instructions. Yeah, now one thing I don't know is uh, whether the defense attorney put up a fuss, right? Because the defense attorney is going to have to say, look, judge, I don't agree with this recklessness. you got to preserve the issue. Yeah, and if the defense attorney either was silent on it or said, yeah, okay, I think we'll take that lesser include, that issue is going to be waived and it's not going to be a good issue on appeal. That's so a good point. So hopefully that defense attorney preserved that issue on appeal by objecting to it and saying, no, judge, judge we're against recklessness now this again is a judgment call right because and we face these on many occasions the question of whether you want a lesser included sometimes you do yeah you know it's better sometimes to have a lesser included because you might want that compromise verdict but other times you might say you know what i don't think they're going to go for the higher charge we don't want that lesser included because the only other option is a not guilty so i don't know how the defense team played this probably back in chambers or wherever it was argued, but it's in the record and uh, hopefully this is preserved because, you know, to me, this looks like a miscarriage of justice. So let's talk about a couple of things that should be irrelevant to the reasonableness analysis here that unfortunately came in that just made the defense look bad, made the defendant look bad. Okay, so this is what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, what not to do after you're involved in a self-defense incident. Well, we tell our AOR clients all the time, you call your lawyer, you call that emergency hotline. So imagine that happens, right? And if he had called us at this point, we would have said, shut up, don't talk to the cops. Of course we would have said, not, not only us, right? Because we're not really special on this point. Any competent criminal defense lawyer, you could call anybody you want on the internet if they're doing criminal defense work you say hey you know i was just involved in an incident i stabbed some people i think one of them might have died or something the police are on their way what should i do a hundred percent of them are going to say shut up that's right don't make any statement none of them are going to say go in and just try to explain to the cops uh, waive your fifth amendment rights go and try to explain to the cops your side of the story that'll likely improve your situation no no competent criminal defense attorney so, would say that unfortunately what does mr mew do well let's see what the jury saw at trial camera recording started Still doing all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's going Temperature? On? Temperature's okay in here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Somebody, right. I hear somebody got stabbed. Um, and I fit the description. Yes, you do. All right. Yep. So we're working through that now. So he, he basically pretends that he's not involved. And uh, this is what we might call consciousness of guilt evidence. We should talk about that. So prosecutors are allowed in most jurisdictions to show certain things to try to make the jury draw an inference. And the inference is he wouldn't have done this unless he was actually guilty. Come on. And yeah. so lying he must to have the known. cops. Yeah. He must have known he was guilty. Look at how he lied and pretended. This is really dumb. Yeah. I mean, this is really dumb, right? This is the kind of thing a prosecutor loves to get. Yeah, like, for example, and one of the most common ones that we see is if the defendant uh, fled the scene. Yep. So, right, pro prosecutors will seize on that and say, ladies and gentlemen, why wouldn't he have stuck around? This is even worse. Wrong? This is you flat lied. You're a liar, aren't you? You right. flat lied lied to the police how are we supposed how's this jury supposed to believe that you're not lying to them right now you're a liar right do we agree on that you are a liar i mean the prosecutor had a big smile when the prosecutor saw that so look how many times have you and i said the worst evidence in the entire case comes right out of the defendant's mouth many many times but here's why this particular one makes me angry mark and one of the other reasons i'm so upset with this verdict is this shouldn't matter we have the incident on video we have the incident on video so whether or not he lied to the cops whether or not he fled the scene should be completely irrelevant to whether at the time that he deployed that knife whether he was in imminent risk of serious physical injury or death should be irrelevant but the, you know, jury, those jurors the jury, hated the that. jury, the jury, they're not professionals. They're not professional lawyers. They're human beings. And they looked at that and they just decided we don't like the guy. Yeah. I mean, if this was a case where you were just relying on the defendant's word, which is a lot of times what you got in a self-defense case, right? The defense is here's what happened. This would be devastating. Right. 
um, but you got a video here. But, you know, admittedly, the video is not perfect, it's right? It's shaking around, yeah. It's a mess. It's all over the place. And the jury's just going to hate the guy, right? Mm. They're on the jury, and they're saying, and they're looking at this. And, you know, now that you see the video and you know what happened, especially when the guy testifies and says, yeah, I did this. And you watch that clip there, and you say, this guy, he's pretending. I, I hear there was a stabbing, and the guy looks like me. This is just awful. It just makes you not likable. It should be irrelevant. Yeah, but you got humans on the jury, and they. this is just turn up the I hate the guy meter when you see that kind of thing going on. Well, on the subject of complete irrelevancies or what should be complete irrelevancies and tugging on the emotions of the non-professionals in the jury, uh, I want to say something about this spark of life evidence that was presented in Wisconsin. So there are certain jurisdictions that allow the state in their case when they have a victim uh, who passed away as a result of what the defendant did, allow testimony and evidence to be presented in order to humanize them to the jury. The idea here is that we don't want the jury to just see this as a nameless, faceless victim. We want to talk about their upbringing and how much their family loved them and all the wonderful things that they wanted to do with their lives so that the jury would take it really, really seriously. Now, I think this type of evidence is outrageous. It's intended to stoke an emotional reaction to distract the jury from their duty, frankly. Yeah, just just to focus in on that, it's outrageous in the guilt phase, right? And to keep in mind, Good point. Yep. the guilt phase is the trial, right? The trial is the part where we're determining whether somebody is guilty or not. In that phase, what relevance does it bring about tugging on the heartstrings of, oh, this victim, the guy, the kid who was stabbed was such a wonderful human. And this is irrelevant. This is calculated to get the emotions of those people on the jury out out of control. Yeah, they, they put the deceased's mom on the stand who cried and talked about how she missed her child. And I'm sure all of that was completely 100% genuine. And that's exactly why it should be excluded. Yeah, it's because irrelevant. Because it's incredibly inflammatory. It's inflammatory and it's too totally irrelevant to whether or not the defendant is guilty of the crime. Yeah, you take a look at other rules of evidence. We don't allow you to just bring in character assassination evidence, for example. Like, they can't line up in a, in a criminal case. They can't just line up people who hate the defendant, maybe all the ex-girlfriends or ex-wives or just people who don't like them, put them on the stand one by one and say, yeah, I, I know it's irrelevant to what happened here, but he's just a jerk. Let me tell you, jury, what just a bad human being we are dealing with. We have rules of evidence to correct correctly exclude that type of stuff, just like we have rules of evidence to correctly exclude things like bolstering, we may call it. And the point is that those rules of evidence are in place to exclude inflammatory irrelevancies from the jury's calculation. Yeah, two points here. Point number one, it's totally relevant in the sentencing phase, right? So the the phase that this case is now moving into for the judge to consider the appropriate punishment, all of this stuff becomes relevant, right? right? Who was this guy? Because at that point, we're past the issue of has the state carried their burden beyond a reasonable doubt that he's guilty of the crime now we're to what are what's the sentence going to be yeah. for this and the rule is the judge can consider all types of things for so them. second point remember it's not supposed to be a sort of even game there's a reason we try to slant things in favor of not guilty right this is why the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. So there are several things that are supposed to be baked into the cake to avoid somebody who's actually innocent getting wrongfully convicted. And one of those things is exactly this issue as to the defendant. The defendant gets to bring in character evidence to essentially show the defendant's a good guy. Sometimes this is referred to as the mercy rule. But remember, if you as a defense attorney decide you want to bring in evidence just to tell the jury that the defendant is a great guy, they could have done that here. Uh, hey, he's a great guy. He helps old ladies across the street and this and that. You have opened the door to allow the state to contradict that evidence, to now say the stuff you previously said was excluded, now it gets to come in. So lots of times you gotta be very careful about opening that door. But to allow the evidence 
for the victim, and the victim here, meaning the kid who died, who was stabbed, it's just outrageous. I hope this is also going to be an appellate issue. I don't think it should be admitted. I think it cuts in the wrong direction in terms of what we care about, what the founders cared about, which was that better that 10 guilty go free than one innocent gets convicted. Allowing this kind of evidence makes it more likely that an innocent gets convicted. Yeah, it's just the problem with that is it's not likely to be an appellate issue because keeping in mind that appellate issues are when the judge does something illegal or legally incorrect. There apparently is a statute and it's allowed by the law of Wisconsin to do this type of things just as it is in other jurisdictions. So it's not all jurisdictions, uh, but in this particular jurisdiction, it'd be hard to say that there was an error of law, um, but it can still be potentially challenged for its constitutionality. Yeah, and also there's other rules of evidence, 403, there's balancing tests there, and uh, while it's unlikely that a court of appeal would say the judge balanced it incorrectly, and it was so incorrectly that it affected a fair trial, right? They might say... Yeah, let's talk about 403. You want to explain that real quick so we can explain this balancing test? Yeah, 403 basically, and this is a rule of evidence. People can check it out. Rules of evidence, rule 403. It, It essentially... Um, says that when you go through the analysis, even if something is admissible, if it is substantially more prejudicial than it is probative. So what that means is if it's got some value in terms of making an issue in the case that's relevant more or less likely, but it is substantially outweighed by this sort of inflaming the jury kind of thing, and this is a balancing test, then it's not supposed to be admitted. Right. It's sort of a final test. And, and again, this might come up in, say, a murder case where there's lots of gruesome photos, right? And the state might have a 20 ugly photos of blood and guts and this and that. And you say, look, judge, uh, allowing all of this evidence comes, it's going to violate rule 403. Yeah, let's give a hypothetical in that to talk about the balancing test. So the prosecutor might say, yes, judge, we need to show the uh, picture of the murder scene with all the gruesome photos because it has the probative value of showing the jury where in the apartment the body was found. So we want to present that. If that's relevant. And then we might stand up and say, okay, judge, but it's so prejudicial. It's so grisly and everything like that and for perhaps we can get that testimony introduced through the cop he says yes i found it right here on the diagram sometimes the we pull a and judge will stipulate that the body was found <laughs> right there and and then the judge will say well the the state has the uh, ability to tell the story of the case but in any event what a judge would likely do is say okay I'll let one or two pictures in, but I'm not going to let all 20 pictures of blood and guts come in. So that's the kind of thing that you try to balance with 403. There's probably a balancing test. It's possible that the Court of Appeals looks at that and says, the judge balanced it incorrectly, but we don't think it was big enough to to fundamentally undermine the fairness of the trial. Harmless error. Harmless error. And that harmless error doctrine will get you a lot as well on appeal. And so, um, you know, sometimes the standard here is going to be abuse of discretion. So this is a high standard. A very high standard, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you can make an argument if it's a, it's a pure legal question. You can say, well, the Court of Appeals can look at it, uh, we call it de novo, fresh eyes. They have to get it right. But probably this is going to be an abuse of discretion standard. And my guess is they're going to say even if the judge made a mistake, it's probably not enough to get you a new trial. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. But you it, still raise it. People have misconceptions about what an appeal is in America. It's definitely not you get a whole new attempt to get out of the conviction. It's definitely not the jury got it wrong, and so the appellate court should overturn it. You're looking for an abuse of discretion, generally. It's a very high standard. A very, very small percentage of appeals are actually successful. But everything should be raised and everything should be fought for. So assuming those issues were preserved, as you mentioned earlier, they should be raised. Yeah, another point it might be worth raising keep in mind mr mew didn't have to testify here and uh, might have been a stronger case if he didn't testify but they decided to have him get on the stand and testify the guy's been detained the whole time to be fair it's a little more difficult uh, prepping a client for trial when they're in custody rather than out of custody i've done both many times but 
in my opinion, this guy could have been better prepared than he was. I mean, I watched uh, most, if not all, of his testimony and the direct and the cross-examination. And, you know, there were so many times where I just said, ugh, I wish the guy had answered the question a little bit differently. And it, it just, to me, and again, some people are harder to prep than others. Sure. But it seemed he could have been prepped a little bit better. Yeah. He could have been a little more polished on this. And I think that hurt him a little bit, too, with some of his answers. Now, to be fair, I don't think that the prosecutor who cross-examined him did a very effective job either. But at the end of the day, he got convicted. And this I is th- a compromise verdict, clearly. We yeah. probably had, as you mentioned earlier, we probably had half the jury say, this looks like self-defense, and half said, this doesn't look like self-defense, but, you know, a kid's dead, and we can't just let him walk out of here. And so they had the recklessness standard there that they convicted him, which is, I mean, they felt like they were giving him a lesser Yeah, uh, a and this is another problem, right? Because... The jurors don't know the available sentence. They, they're guessing. They're thinking, oh, okay, if we get him on the reckless homicide, he'll get a shorter sentence. Well, what they don't realize is that in Wisconsin, he's going to be looking at the rest of his life. Probably. On, even yeah, on the reckless. 50s, yeah. So they really didn't give him much of a break. And here. this is, of course, something that we think is totally flawed about the justice system, mm-hmm. is that we can't tell the jury what the penalties are for these crimes. A defense attorney can't turn to the jury and say, and just to let you know, if you convict him, even under the recklessness standard, he's doing up to 60 years, which I believe is the yeah, statutory maximum. To be fair, right, because we busted a little bit on the fact fact that the spark of life evidence really doesn't go to the question of guilt neither does what the punishment is that's right? fair yeah yeah but you're dealing with lay jurors here and just we humans put more or less time into the decision if we think it's a more serious decision right so i think that again because we're trying to tilt things in a certain direction it does in my view make sense to tell the jurors hey even if you convict him of this reckless homicide he's still looking it up to 60 years on this case just want to let you know ladies and gentlemen that's the point of the spark of life testimony yeah. though is to say oh they're going to think harder about it and want to go more this way and consider it really important unless they hear this stuff well okay fair enough but unless they hear what the consequences are same kind of argument there frankly both you know there's an argument both should be excluded if one comes in maybe the other comes in But bottom line is, it should be slanted against the state. If either one of these things come in, it should be the reality, the objective reality of what the guy is looking at if he's convicted. Because you do think uh, much more stringently about something. You take something much more seriously if it's a bigger consequence, right? Needless to say... I would have loved to have defended this guy. Yeah. Would have loved to have tried this case. If this guy was an AOR member, oh no question, hundred yeah. percent chance we're going to cover this guy and go out there and fight hard for him. I think this was a miscarriage of justice. I don't think he should be spending the rest of his life in prison. I think it's an outrage. So jury came back with a guilty verdict. Let's just see what that looked like. We should hear Nikolai Mew's fate in mere moments. All right, please be seated. <laughs> This moment, man. This is always All right, the this moment. Session on the record in state of Wisconsin versus Nikolai Mew. Uh, the attorneys are present with Mr. Mew. You think it's tense Both watching on TV. Oh. I tell people all the time, when you're in that Mr. courtroom Ashton, waiting for that verdict. Did your jury reach a verdict? Yeah. Did you reach a verdict on each of the six counts? Yes, we did. Okay, please hand the verdict forms to the bailiff. Words can't describe how tense what this, this is. What this is like, yeah. yeah, when they pass it to the judge and the judge takes a peek and hands it back. And, uh, it's like an eternity. Yeah. Verdicts read as follows. As to count one of the information, Isaac Schumann, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree reckless homicide as submitted. Question, did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count two of the information, Alexander Martin, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. 
As to count three of the information, Dante Carlson, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count four of the information, Anthony Carlson, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count five of the information, Riley Madison, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as submitted. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count six of the information, Madison Cohen, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of battery as charged. Did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. Uh, members of the jury, uh, I do have to verify that this is, in fact, a unanimous verdict. Uh, so, I'm so the jury returned guilty verdicts on all six counts. Right now, there is no sentencing date for Mr. Mew. Uh, we're going to keep an eye on it, and as soon as there's a sentencing date, I'm very interested to see what the sentence is going to be in this case. As we were talking about earlier, the sentencing phase is where uh, we should expect to see both sides, uh, both the uh, the uh, state presenting a lot of these family members talking about uh, how it affected them as aggravation, and we should also hopefully see lots of mitigation in the case, maybe some stuff relevant to his health, maybe some stuff relevant to Mr. Mew's family ties and character and things like that. Remorse. Yeah. Remorse. The judge can consider a wide range of things at Everything. a sentencing. Yeah. yeah, you know, this is, in my opinion, a good example of how juries sometimes get it wrong. And even when you act well within the law, and to me, you got a guy here, I think the quadruple bypass is a really important fact mm -hmm. here, right? Even though nobody else knew about it, it doesn't matter. He was at risk of death or serious physical injury, imminently so, and we saw the video, right? This guy, I think, was within his rights to defend himself, and yet the jury convicted him anyways. Mm -hmm. He could have walked away. He didn't have to walk away legally, but he could have walked away. Let this be a lesson that even if you live in a place where there is no legal duty to retreat, you are foolish if you can retreat safely and you don't because you don't want to be in this position. Even if they had won this trial and you got a not guilty on every verdict, I can assure you Mr. Mew wouldn't feel like he had a good day that day. Yeah, he would have preferred not to go through these years of his life, probably tens of thousands of dollars if you hired an attorney, if not, you know, just stress and everything like that. So I think it's a sad situation. I hope it gets reversed on appeal. I think this is why when we tell people, look, um, maybe you have a good case and we think it fits, you still don't know what a jury is going to do. And I think this is a reason why a lot of people especially when they're faced at these crazy long mandatory minimum sentences, don't want to take the risk. And this is why you see such a high percentage of plea bargains, which is, again, one of the things I think we should change. I think we should get rid of mandatory minimum sentencing. I think judges should have discretion to put the guy on probation. I think, you know, if I'm the judge in this case, I understand that, look, the jury came back with a guilty but on the other hand, this was a really tough situation. Mm -hmm. This was a close call. We don't need to deter this guy from doing this again. My understanding is that he's got no priors, no problems. He's otherwise, I think there was testimony during the trial, he has a reputation for peacefulness. This is not a guy out looking for trouble. He wasn't looking for trouble that day. He's not likely to do it again. He doesn't need to be rehabilitated. Punishment. I mean, how much punishment does the guy need after being, you know, beat down like he was? Was in the water the guy had his hand around his neck he pulled out a knife and defended himself I mean how much punishment does he need for well, that according to a grieving family who now you know the jury has agreed with them that he took their child's life unjustifiably I mean the only thing that could make them happy is if he does the rest of his life in prison that's not gonna make them happy and I'm sure we're gonna hear all about that at the sentencing we're gonna see a lot of crying family members uh, from not only the deceased but we're probably gonna hear the other victims who survived uh, show up per perhaps some of the people who got stabbed show 
show up and talk to the judge about how you know how the whole thing affected their lives. It's yeah. going to be a big, ugly, nasty yep. sentence. And here. the judge is going to have a lot of pressure on them to give a long sentence here right. because there's going to be a lot of friends of the kids who died and got stabbed who are all going to come in and talk about how wonderful they were and they were just out on the river that day looking to have a good time and here's this guy stabbing people. Although that's not what happened in yeah. this case. Yeah, so there you have it, guys. Two seasoned criminal defense attorneys who specialize in self-defense law who both believe that the jury got it wrong here and that the guy acted appropriately at the time of the stabbings. And still, the jury convicted him. He probably should have walked away from the situation. I'm sure he wishes now that he had walked away from the situation, even though he wasn't mandated by the law to do so. And this is why, because the system ain't perfect. You know what? Situational awareness, right? When you're looking around and you see all these kids and they're drunk and they're acting like a bunch of idiots, forget about the phone. Just walk out of there and, and make sure you ha let them go down the river and make sure you have a good rest of the day and avoid these kinds of problems. That's really the number one important lesson. Number two, just shut up. Yeah, absolutely. If there's another lesson you could learn here, don't talk to the police. I feel like we've been beating that dead horse in every single video, but let this be another lesson to you folks. All right, everybody, go and check out attorneysonretainer.us to learn all about our self-defense program and what it can do for you. Learn about our law firm at attorneysforfreedom.com. Learn about the philosophy of how we defend people in these types of cases. If you liked the video, make sure to throw a like on it. Throw a comment down below with your questions. Maybe we missed something about the trial that you wanted to get our take on. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share it with a friend. Until next time, this is attorney Andy Markintel and attorney Mark J. Victor. Peace. Peace.